Now, from right here in Jerusalem, a briefing on the past six months of the new Israeli government and politics in general. Joining Stan with us is Rotem Benkel, is senior contributing editor and diplomatic correspondent of the Jerusalem Post, Lahav Harkov. Hi, love. Hi. So thank you for coming, and thank you for your continued dedication to stay with us. I would like to ask you, so you've been covering Israeli government affairs for years now, and tell me, what, what have the Israeli government's first six months been like? Any major accomplishments or setbacks? So this government is very unique. It is diverse at a level that we really have not seen. Um, you know, the government that ranges from an Islamist party to the far left, to um, figures who were, until not that long ago, considered on the far right, you know, and everyone in between. And the, the government began, I think, with a really wide expectation in Israel that it was going to fail. Uh, but so far, it has held on for six months. So that's really, um, I know that that's maybe setting the bar very low, but I think that its big achievement is that it's managed to survive this long. Um, and it's managed to survive this long because the different members of this coalition, as I said, you know, we have the far left and the far right. We have centrist parties like Yesha and Blue and White um, and others. And they're all sort of compromising and hearing each other out and holding a dialogue. And it's a dialogue between sectors in Israeli society, really, through their representatives. Um, so that's, you know, that's really what their achievement has been. Their number one achievement so far has been, I think, that they've put us back on track for political stability um, and for a relatively civil dialogue when politics had gotten to a really polarized place in the couple of years before that, when we had four elections, basically one right after the other. Um, you know, and there are a lot of everyday sort of things going on in politics, but I think if you ask Israelis, that would be the, its main one. Great. So after saying that, do you think this government is more right wing, left wing? Or is it balancing itself? What do you think? I think that it's relatively balanced. I think, you know, in Israel, when you ask who's right wing and who's left wing, traditionally the answer to that question had to do with um, how people view the solution to the conflict with the Palestinians. Um, and specifically through the prism of concessions of land. So the further you got to the right, the less likely you were to concede any land or any kind of autonomy for Palestinians on our land, greater autonomy that would be. Um, and the further you get to the left, the sort of more land you would want to concede. Um, I think that Israel's in, in a little bit of a different place politically right now because, again, after we had these four elections, one right after the other, there were major figures on the right who said, we need to sort of break out of this paralysis. Um, there were also concerns with former Prime Minister Netanyahu's corruption trials and like, should that be a person who's leading the country, yes or no? Um, and so they sort of broke that. And so now you have people like Prime Minister Naftali Bennett sitting in a coalition with the Labour and Merits parties and also Ram, the Islamist party, who are very much for a two-state solution. Um, you know, so these sides that are diametrically opposed are sitting together now. So the, the solution they've come to on that front is that they're, they're basically not going to deal with that issue. They're going to deal with the Palestinians on an economic and humanitarian level, on a security level when it's necessary and unfortunately it's necessary, but not on the diplomatic level. Which brings us to much more everyday sort of quotidian issues that I think a lot of people outside of Israel don't think about as much. Um, you know, on the day that we're recording this, there's a big debate going on about um, importing fruits and vegetables, which for some people is a huge matter of we should be supporting our local farmers. And for other people take a, I guess, a more capitalist view of, no, we should lower taxes in general, including on fruit, in order to lower the cost of living for Israeli consumers. And, you know, I'm sure people who live in any country in the world that are listening to this have heard of similar debates in their own countries. Um, so that's where we're at. And then it when it comes to a stance like that, those those opinions that I've talked about, just, just to give that example about fruit and imports, you have those different voices and they have to talk and reach a compromise. Mm -hmm. So it, I would say it is balanced as opposed to left or right. Okay, so you just mentioned right now that we have an air party. And I wanted to ask you what exactly is Ram asking for uh, the Arab sector and how are they working with the rest of the Knesset? It's the first time that they're there. Ram is a really interesting case. Um, Ram used to be part of the joint list, which was a block of a bunch of different Arab parties. And traditionally, even before the joint list existed, the Arab parties did vote as a block. 
Um, they tended to be sort of socially conservative, but very, very far to the left on diplomatic issues. And they would abstain from issues of religion and state in a sort of deal where, you know, you don't deal with our religious issues and we won't touch your religious issues. Um, but Ram started to feel that, oh, and over the years, over the decades, these Arab parties were, were basically always in the opposition. There hasn't been an Arab party in a coalition since there were these sort of Arab parties that were satellites mm -hmm. of the Labour Party 50 years ago, 50 plus years ago. Um, so, you know, the, the Ram party and its leader, Mansour Abbas, started to feel that for the Arab parties to automatically be in the opposition at all times and to resist cooperation most of the time, uh, with the other Zionist parties, um, was not getting the Arab public anywhere. Um, and so he decided first to, from the opposition, to just work with the coalition more. And at the time, that was Prime Minister Netanyahu. Um, and now in this new coalition, he is actually a part of a coalition. Now, they don't um, have, they're not in the cabinet. They're not ministers. And that's a choice that they made um, in Israel. If you remember the cabinet, you hold legal responsibility for everything the government does. And I think that that has a lot to do with sort of the Palestinians and how they feel about that issue, that they don't want to hold responsibility for it. But um, they are a big part of this coalition because it has a very narrow majority. And every vote of every Ram member counts. And they have leveraged that. Um, First of all, there's a huge task force and a lot of money being poured in to fight crime in the Arab sector. Um, Ar crime in the Arab sector has really spiked in recent years. Um, there were over, I believe, over 120 murders in 2021 within the mm -hmm. Arab community. Um, so a lot of really big issues going on there and more money now is going into policing and programs within the community. Um, and then another big thing that, that is actually a controversy in this coalition, there's debate about it, is, you know, there's a lot of um, illegal construction in Arab towns. Um, and Ram would argue that it's because they're not giving enough building permits, whereas others would argue, no, that's simply illegal construction. People aren't asking for building permits. And I'm not going to take a side on that. But um, the, there's this big debate right now is that Ram wants everyone to be connected to the electric grid. Anyone who's been living in a house for years, doesn't matter if it's a legal house, not a legal house, they should have electricity. And there's a debate about this, about whether you're encouraging law breaking or whether it's a humanitarian issue and these people have families and they've been living in the house for years. Um, so, you know, that, that is like a really big thing right now. Um, and, and basically they're bringing a voice in Israeli government and in Israeli coalition that we weren't hearing as much up until now. So we were talking about the domestic front and I want to ask you what about what's happening with the Palestinian conflict? Any movements and peace talks? So as I said, this government has sort of agreed to disagree and therefore they don't want to hold any kind of peace talks. That being said, what the different parties within the government have agreed on is to help the Palestinians economically and to try to improve um, just the, the quality of life for the Palestinians, um, which you know is, is both in some ways a humanitarian issue, but also um, viewed as a net benefit for Israel, that people with a higher quality of life will be less likely to you know, go, go to terrorism. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's all kinds of little things that's, that are being done, like increasing the amount of work permits for Palestinians to enter Israel. Um, that, that's a big one, and it's been sort of gradually increasing over these six months. Um, but there's also higher level things going on. Um, the Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas has met twice with Defense Minister Benny Gantz. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, Gantz has, you know, the, he's the former chief of staff of the IDF and the chief of staff during um, in 2014 in the Gaza conflicts. And interestingly, he has become the dovish figure. Um, and some say that he wants to be like the next Yitzhak Rabin. Um, so he's met twice with Abbas, with Palestinian Abbas, not a Knesset member Abbas. Um, and the second time Abbas even came to his home, um, he hosted him in his home. Um, that being said, again, there's, there's no peace talks. The prime minister, the foreign minister say there's peace talks are not going to happen. And these are only about security arrangements and economic arrangements. And we shouldn't forget, I mean, you know, it's not just about a tough ideological stance from Naftali Bennett. It takes two to tango. And the Palestinian Authority has continued its pay for slay policy, uh, which is that they provide monthly payments to terrorists in Israeli prisons and the families of terrorists who are killed by Israeli forces. Um, and the longer the prison sentence, or if the person died, then you get paid more. So if you kill people or if you kill more people, you get paid more. And Israelis say, you know, these are salaries for terrorists. You're 
incentivizing killing Israelis. Um, that's going on. And the other things going on is that the Palestinians still have a case on the docket against Israel in the International Criminal Court and against Gantz specifically. Gantz has been meeting with Abbas. They are pressing charges against him as though he is a war criminal. Um, so it's not like, you know, the Palestinians are with open arms saying, let's have peace talks right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so we talked a bit about the Palestinian conflict and the peace talks that we're not doing right now. Uh, let's let's talk about Iran. Internationally, there are talking and movements that are going on in that area. Do you think anything will change regarding Israeli policy? So there has been a nuanced change in Israeli policy. In the previous government, former Prime Minister Netanyahu wanted nothing to do with any negotiations with Iran. He thought the 2015 deal was bad, and therefore the Biden administration's goal to return to that deal is bad, and he wasn't going to talk about it with them as long as they were pursuing that policy. Mm -hmm. This government still thinks the Iran deal is bad, still thinks the Biden administration should not pursue a return to it. However, they believe that by talking to the Biden administration and to the British and the French, the Germans, to a somewhat lesser extent, the Russians and Chinese, but they're talking to everyone who's involved in these talks, except for Iran, of course. Um, by talking to those people, there can be incremental changes to the bad deal to make it slightly less bad for Israel. So in both cases, unhappy with the Iran deal, you know, a return to JCPOA is not enough for Israel's security. And the reason is that it does not place enough limitations on Iran's nuclear program. And those limitations do not last long enough. It also does not limit Iran's um, ability to fund terrorist proxies around the region and its ballistic missile program. Um, those, those things still stand. But at this point, the government is focused on trying to mitigate the damage and trying to say, okay, maybe lift fewer sanctions. Make sure Iran doesn't get as much money that it can spend on its terrorist proxies or on its nuclear program. Um, and, and it's, I mean, it's unfortunate that that's the place where we're at, right? Because the world is trying, they're trying so hard to reach a, a deal that really is not good for Israel. Um, but this government hopes that somewhere in the margins that it won't be as bad for Israel. And that's, that's where they're different from, say, the Netanyahu government. Okay. I want to ask you before we, f we finish, uh, is there anything that we aren't hearing uh, that's going on right now, something that maybe should be on our radar? After the Abraham Accords were announced in August 2020, there was a flurry of diplomatic activity and we had four countries announcing diplomatic relations with Israel. Only three of those came to fruition because Sudan has a civil war now and you know, eventually, hopefully that'll, mm -hmm. you know, calm down and we can have relations with them. But, you know, there was talk about so many different countries, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Mauritania. Um, and I have to say a lot of that, you know, it slowed down a bit. The Biden administration was trying to figure out sort of where it felt. And they said positive things about the Abraham Accords and they weren't sure where they wanted to move forward with it. And you really need an American buy-in to move these things forward. Um, but there, there are talks going on now. It's already been reported that uh, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken um, spoke with his Indonesian counterpart about ties with Israel. And I can say that there are others, sort of all kinds of small islands around the world that might have relations with Israel and some African Muslim countries. Um, and so I hope that 2022 is a year in which we'll hear about more countries uh, establishing relations with Israel. I hope so too. Lavarkov, thank you very much.